So welcome back to this hall and welcome David. Hello. Or uh, Sviki, as I should say. Um, this is usually an hour-long presentation because I have the audacity to put a bit of a practical in the middle. Um, so I'm going to be skipping over a couple of sections where there might be information on the slides. There's certainly deeper information in the notes that I'm more than happy to just kind of talk about at the end if we've got time. But certainly, yeah, you know, come and talk to me. Uh, in the networking lunch uh, around the subjects like DSDM and such. But before I get into that, what I'm going to go through is the quick overview of, of the presentation. It's uh, what we're going to do, why we needed to become agile, scrum boards, uh, the practical walkthrough, and then get to the point which is what are the tips, that, how can we increase visibility. So before I introduce myself, uh, I just want to give you an idea of the problem I'm trying to solve. So the problem I'm trying to solve is uh, I work for a company called Call Credit. I'm David Weir. I'm the head of development. And Call Credit is a data company primarily. So I'm not going to talk too much about Call Credit. Uh, but the key things for this presentation is they're a data company with large volumes of data. A company with large volumes of data and large number of employees is you generally find that there's a large number of projects going on at any point in time, 20 plus in our scenario. We're split into three market sectors, credit, so credit reference agency, marketing, consumer. So again, we've got different drivers from different angles. When data is your asset, you generally find that all projects are interdependent on each other, which gives you a lot of uh, a need to understand what's going on in projects at any point in time uh, and what, what knock-on effects one project might have onto another. Equally, we, uh, we, we kind of service in some you know, large uh, industrial in, uh, institutions, so financial sectors, telecom sectors. So there's a, a large demand for what we're doing, so we had to be flexible and quick at uh, delivering new products to the market, but again, managing this, this problem somehow of interdependency. Uh, and nice problems to have, all problems which have um, come about through increasing in size, increasing in revenue. So we kind of realized this around about two years ago because about uh, 2000 was when Core Credit actually um, was, was born. Um, and since then, it's kind of grown not only in size, number of people, it's grown through acquisition, it's got grown organically. Uh, we've actually uh, acquired eight sub companies over the last 12 years, which is quite a lot. Um, and that brings with it different dynamics in terms of different teams, different um, you know, kind of ways of working. Um, but fundamentally, it made us recognize that we needed to actually change things and actually align a proper operating model. So we realigned our HRI legal and, and, and facilities. And we thought, at the same time, we're going to introduce Agile. Um, we chose DSDM, which, again, um, is a three-day course. Um, it's, it's very similar to Scrum. Um, However, it's a little bit more business friendly. And the reason uh, we chose that was the business friendly terms that are used in, Scrum, uh, sorry, in, in DSDM as opposed to Scrum is it tries to operate at a level where um, the terminology that is being used is friendly to the business. So it gives you deadlines. So it's focusing on delivering to a date where you drop scope if necessary and you don't uh, compromise on quality. These are business-friendly terms where, as opposed to something like Scrum when you're trying to sell it to the business where you know, we're not sure exactly when it's going to be delivered, but you can change your mind whenever you want. And when you're trying to embed a whole framework, it's, uh, it, can, it can be the difference between embedding it properly um, on, or, or having something from the technical uh, departments pushing the, the framework across. So that's enough talking about that. Um, DSDM and any kind of agile approach is uh, as, as, as wide as it is long in terms of the different techniques you can use to, to bed it incorrectly. And today I just want to focus on scrum boards or whiteboards because this is the clear thing that we are wanting to get from a, uh, an enterprise point of view as a selling this thing back to the business. The, the big thing about whiteboards, whether you're using scrum, XP, whether you're using Crystal, um, there's always some concept of a focal point for the team where they can come together, collaborate, talk about um, how the velocity is going. You can measure the velocity through, through things like burndowns. Um, 
we can focus making sure they're working on the right things, what's blocked, time's left, that kind of thing. It's great for the team. The project teams are fantastic for understanding what it is they need to be delivering and delivering features uh, rather than delivering some kind of long-winded architecture. But the thing that's often overlooked um, far too often, especially when we're talking about these things from the business point of view, is these scrum boards are a kind of shop window. So when you look at a scrum board, you should be able to see you know, kind of how, how well that project's doing without having to have gone on these extensive three-day DSDM courses, without having to have full understanding of, of what Agile is. You want to actually understand, well, How's that project looking? Are they working on the things that are important to me? Are there issues that are concerning that project that I can potentially help with? Uh, so it's thinking about projects and scrum boards and, uh, and, and Kanban boards beyond just meeting the needs of the, uh, the actual project team it's there for. So we can all agree that project boards, scrum boards are great. Um, but provided we stick to a couple of different rules, then we can make them even better for the program or better for the enterprise. So here's a couple of examples of scrum boards that I just took off the inter internet. Um, looks like a pretty good one. A bit messy. This is a bit more clinical. It works. I'm sure it works. It, it, it was up there. I found it on a website, which was example in um, you know kind of how to do things. And this is my favourite one because it was actually made out of a bit of a cardboard box. Um, Got all, all the elements there. It's 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 you know kind of got the burn down charts and it's got some envelopes for uh, the backlog. Uh, looks like it's actually going right to left somehow, but I'm <laughs> doesn't doesn't really matter because it's individual to each of the projects. It does exactly what it needs to do for that project to succeed. So let's have a look at some of our whiteboards, and they're very similar along the same themes. You've got the Swim lanes, you've got various different stickers, you've got avatars for people, you've got backlogs. Um, this is another one, quite different, but again, you can see there's a bit of a similar theme going on there. And there's like a final one, which again, has, has, has got a bit more information. So the difference between the whiteboards we're running in our company and the whiteboards that I kind of randomly selected off the internet is hopefully you saw a little bit more consistency in ours rather than the, the, the kind of random selection that I took. That doesn't mean to say that they aren't individually serving each project to the needs of that project. And it doesn't mean to say the other project boards are going to do it better or worse than these ones. But what this does do is it kind of just gives me a bit of an idea of what I'm looking at from one project to the next as someone who is interested in all of the projects, not just one specific one. So this looks like a good time box or a sprint, but how can you tell? Because to me, it just looks a little bit like post-it notes with some swim lanes and, and an avatar. So this, is anyone have any idea if that's a good time box or a sprint or if that's a bad one? Or do I need to be concerned as someone who's interested in the wider picture about that project? Chances are you can't tell or you can't read from that far back. So the first quick win, I would suggest that's uh, you know, kind of any company that's running multiple agile projects uh, perform, is having some kind of project information visible on the scrum boards, whiteboards, so that any person who's wandering past can kind of pick out some key information about the, uh, the project, where there's these lots of sticky notes appearing. Uh, there's lots of optional things you can put on there, like rag status, current iteration you're in, or time ox. If you're feeling really brave, you can put the due date. Um, leave that one up to you. But the, the most important thing, aside from the name of the project, I would say is the time box start date and the time box end date. And here's a, here's a, uh, a scrum board again. And again, we can't really tell if that's a good time box or a bad time box. Um, but if we bring that into play, suddenly things are starting to make a bit more sense. So this is, uh, if we just pretend the date at the moment is the 1st of September, then 
we know the time box doesn't finish until the 11th of September. So that looks like we've got an awful lot of time to actually finish these tasks that are in the backlog. We even might get a chance to do some of these other items. And that looks like a reasonable time box to me, or a sprint. So if now we think, actually, the date's the 10th of September, so this is finishing tomorrow, well, suddenly, this is a whole different story. I've got big concerns with this project because there's no way anyone's going to be able to complete all of that thing, all of them tasks in backlog um, and have them fully quality tested and put into a state of our definition of done. So context is really important, um, but it doesn't have to be at the consequence of the individuality of the, uh, the project needs. So the next thing is have a bit of a consistent sectors. Now, that, I'm not talking about the swim lanes, although it is if people are going to have you know, kind of queue areas, um, you know, try and use them consistently, or if people are going to call things in progress or work in, kind of stick to one name and, and, and run with that. But what we like to do is we try to actually differentiate stories from the tasks. And we do that two ways. We do it by putting stories in the higher half of the, uh, the whiteboard and the tasks in the lower half. And we also do it by color coding. So a story, which is a presentation of what a story is in its own right, so I won't delve into that too much, um, as opposed to a task, which is something usually that a, a story is broken into, uh, something that m more technical people are interested in. So the reason we do try and give that dis, uh, you know, kind of distinction is as a business person or someone who's not actively involved in that specific project, if I know the green ones are stories, I think I've got, probably got a fighting chance of understanding what a story is for a particular project, especially if I'm someone who, uh, maybe a project sponsor who happens to be uh, you know, kind of paying for the project, you're not going to understand what the tasks are because there's such a, a, a granular level for uh, technical people. But you probably are interested in the stories. And if you see all of your stories as a business person who happens to be walking past um, the project boards or, or, or have been given a demonstration, and you see all of your stories in the dropped category, or you see all of your stories are backloaded in the uh, prioritization list, then suddenly you can have something to say about that. If you don't understand, then the whole thing just looks like a, a jargon of mess, and uh, you can't really tell one post-it note from another because, well, it looks like some of the whiteboards that we found off the internet, then it kind of, it kind of becomes hard to actually get that real collaboration with the business and get them to buy in to what you're doing. Otherwise, it just feels like they're constantly losing out, or they have no idea where they're up to. Um, with Waterfall, at least they felt they knew what they were, think they were going to get at the beginning, even though they'd probably be shocked and surprised at the end. Um, with Agile, we often find, you know, they don't really understand where, they are, where, you know, where their particular feature that they're interested in is up to at any point in time. And then we have two other consistent uh, post-it notes that we try and insist all whiteboards follow. Uh, one's a blocker and another is an issue. Uh, we try and distinguish between the two, blocker being something that a project is asking for help um, because they can't resolve it within their own project team. So by having that as a distinct colour, different from an issue, whereas we define an issue as something which it's gone wrong, but it's something the project is coping with, they understand why it's gone wrong, and it might have delayed the project somewhat, it might be associated specifically with a task or a story, but it's not really something that anyone external to the project can really help with or unblock. Um, so it's more there as a for your information. Whereas a blocker, that's crying out for some kind of help. It's, it's kind of the, if we don't resolve this particular blocker, our project is in serious danger of failing in some way. That might be because you have an infrastructure issue. It might be because um, you, you haven't got enough people working on the project. These are things that typically a project manager can resolve on their own. They would have to go external to um, heads of departments or other projects to kind of resolve these situations. So you kind of find what I found within Core Credit is uh, it's, it's 
been, you know, kind of a lot of a lot of people at my level, the program managers or the the heads of departments, a lot of the uh, even director level, are kind of now tuned in to the colour orange when we kind of walk in through, um, you know, kind of our, our IT area and we see certain boards with you know orange stickers all over it. Uh, you don't need to see specifically what the the blockers are, but you you can kind of home in on the idea that 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 is a project in need of my you know kind of attention i need to go and look at this because the contrast of orange is far too great from the the items that are in the the done category which is really useful to, to to kind of have that consistency so you're not actually trying to always look up on a key as to what does that mean and what does this mean um having consistent progression well we'll go through this a little bit more when we do the practical but quite simply because our shop window essentially is our top area here where the green stickers are, uh, we don't want to be you know, kind of just moving things randomly uh, without some kind of rules and regulations as to how items progress. But this is pretty standard stuff which you'd expect in most Kanban boards. So we see there that we've got uh, story A and story D which are in progress because the tasks that are within story A and story D are, uh, are currently in progress. Some of the tasks are finished, but they still stay in progress. They don't move beyond that until we have actually progressed uh, all of the underlying tasks. So we can do that now, and we can move D2, which is a, a, a subtask of the story D, and we should be moving the story across as well. I know now as a business person that, oh, my story that I'm interested in got no idea what these tasks are, but that story uh, is in QA, so that, that's good. Um, and as it moves out of QA and into done, I'm even happier because I can see my story is done. Another good tip, use them as, as you will, is these, these Q areas are quite nice because that just allows you, uh, someone who's a bit more business orientated, who isn't allowed to touch anything or even ask about anything down here, um, can start to actually suggest the areas that uh, you know, kind of they might want to look at next. So that might be done by a product owner, that might be done by a BA, uh, it might be done by someone in the business. At the end of the day, this is a project board, so no one, you, know, you can still choose from anything in the backlog, but by putting things in the queue, it kind of gives you a hint as to these are probably the things that we should be picking up next, but we don't order them. And what we ensure is when every store is finished, we always have a, uh, a horn, Fortunately, we've not brought them here today, but we always have a horn that we can kind of beep at the end just to celebrate success. So, we're about halfway through. So now I want to kind of go through a practical walkthrough using the whiteboards today. I'm a big believer in still using the old-fashioned whiteboards. I'm sure you've probably seen a lot of digital versions. Um, you've may have seen uh, a, a couple of online products which do some of the similar things. Uh, I just like to go through the you know, kind of motions using post-it notes and, and, and whiteboards, mainly because it's, a, uh, it's, it's, it's the best way of learning how to do it. If you're a scuba diver, you've got to learn all the old-fashioned way of how to do scuba diving. And the first thing you do is you, uh, once you're qualified, you buy a watch that does it all for you. I'm still a believer in doing it this way because it gives you a bit more... Um, a bit more scope for, for changing things ad hoc, but more importantly, you know, we are learning Agile as a business. We've only been doing it two years, so we'll move everything digital once we've, we've really nailed it. So, practical walkthrough. I'm just going to talk through the scenarios, go through some of the designs, go through the plan, and then hopefully we'll move straight on to uh, moving some of these stickers around. So, the overarching goal there's a development conference in Southampton in the UK, which is scheduled for the 4th of May 2013. And we've won the exclusive catering contract. So we're going to supply them with all of the food that they need. So it's a development con conference. So I'm not sure how many developers are in this conference today. OK. So in the UK, we, we, we kind of call the developers code monkeys. You? So we kind of decided we'll, we'll, we'll get some bananas to uh, you know, kind of be the stable block for most of our catering at this development conference. And there's no better place to get bananas from, from uh, than, than Rio in Brazil. 
Uh, another goal or ambition from a business point of view of what we want to do is we want to go via France. Uh, the reason we want to go via France is we can pay an import duty from Brazil to France, which is far less than it would be going directly to the UK. And because of the European Union and the free market, we can import directly from, from France. So money saving all round, and it all sounds like a good idea to do. So here's some non-functional requirements. The transport must arrive before May 2013. Sounds sensible. That's when the conference is. Uh, the bananas will only last six weeks unrefrigerated. So if we're taking them across the Pacific or the Atlantic, then we really need to put some kind of fridge in there. Uh, the Southampton port isn't really been used that well uh, for international trade before. So in a nutshell, we've got to build a boat. We've got to build a lighthouse. So I'm going to build the boat on this side of the room, and my colleague Rimus is going to help build the lighthouse using the Kanban boards there. Don't worry too much if you can't see what the post-it notes are saying. We're building a boat. I don't think anyone in this room is going to use a Kanban board to build a boat using my techniques, but the, the principle and hopefully the visibility of, you know, kind of the consistency of the way we're working will give you an idea of how we're progressing. So this is my boat design. I've gone with a bit of a traditional design. I want somewhere for the crew to be. Uh, the bits with the snowflakes is generally where the bananas are going to be. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's what I want my boat to look like. Um, lighthouse. This was, the, this was the first idea of the lighthouse. Um, didn't think it was that practical, mainly because you know, we can't really see it in the daytime because it's that thin. It's just a big light. So we then thought, this is much better design. We can see this in the daytime. Um, it's a bit thinking outside the box. But we're not really sure that it will withstand all of the you know, kind of winds that we get and torrential rain, if you've ever been to the UK. Um, and it's not really that bright, so you might not be able to see it in the, uh, in the nighttime either. So we stuck with the traditional design. So that's, what, that's, that's going to be the design. That's what we pay our architects for. That's what we pay our UX designers for to come up with fantastic designs like that. So the only thing of note there is we've got a bit of a water wheel to power it. So let's go th quickly through the plan. And I do mean quickly. October, which is now, we're going to start building the boat in Rio. In November, we're going to start building the, uh, the, the lighthouse uh, just off Southampton. So you should see, those who are close enough, we've already got our time boxes planned, which basically have from October to December for the boat and November to January for the lighthouse. So in December, we're generally going to be continuing with the construction, but we're going to take a halfway checkpoint, see where we are, making sure everything's okay, and then we'll we'll do our second iterations. Uh, January, I expect us to just be continuing our iterations. Uh, come March, I expect the boat, sorry, come February, I expect the boat to have set off. Uh, you will note that the lighthouse isn't qu quite finished yet, but we do have the contingency because it does take quite a while for the boat to uh, go across the ocean. In March, I expect the boat to continue sailing all the way through to April, uh, where the lighthouse will have finished by that point. And then in May, and specifically, uh, we are looking at, sorry, in April, the boat will arrive in France. And specifically on the 22nd of April, we would expect the boat to be released from the French port. Uh, the French authorities always release their boats at 4 a.m. in the morning. That way, we expect to see the boat past the lighthouse at around about 12 noon. Okay. And at that point, everyone's happy. Superb. Okay, so, should we uh, start our iteration? Because there's still rocks. 
and you can't see the rocks if it's underwater. So uh, that's why the lighthouse has to be really visible in the daytime, not just in the nighttime. So we're going to build a boat. I've got all my stories planned out here. Get the materials, build the platform, build the stern, the rear, the starboard, port size, build the aft. Um, so I can kind of move a couple of these on. If I'm a business person, I might put some of these in the, in the queue so they get picked up by developers. Um, so let's assume that a lot of these are just kind of happening. Um, those who are closer to the front, you might see that the, uh, the stories have got a, a key next to them, which is, uh, this one's A, and my tasks have got A1, A2, A3. There's no specific order to the tasks, it's just actually giving you some correlation to what task is related to what story, so then you can know how to move things along. It's, it's specifically important if you start doing multiple things at the same time, and as developers, we, uh, you, you probably find that you do do repetitive tasks for different stories, sorry, for different types of stories. So we've got things like cut material here, but this, we've got the same cut material for, uh, for, for story D as we, have, as we have for story C. So you can see how we're moving things along quite easily. Um, and eventually, with all projects, you'll probably find that we have an issue. So if we get to this point here, and we find out that there is a supply delay. So straight away, we've put a, a blocker on there, um, and someone hopefully can help out with this supply delay. I'd argue whether that's a blocker, because it depends how late that delay is. And if the delay is only about a week, and if there's other things you can be getting on with, then I'd very much argue that isn't a blocker, and why cry wolf and, and get everyone's attention when actually it's more like an issue. So at this point, we've got an issue. We're a bit behind. Um, we can resolve that issue, and chances are we're going we're gonna to finish all of this on time. So we get to our halfway checkpoint. We've got all of our uh, items, our stories done. And this is what the, the boat looks like. So now we're going to hand over to, to Rimus, who's going to quickly go through the first stage of building the lighthouse. So basically, uh, I will not kind of just go in very detail how it goes, but uh, more or less, I'll just move the user stories so you can see that some of the stuff is progressing. So uh, uh, the the project itself is uh, more sequential. So basically, it means that you just need to go through the story uh, A, B, C, D in in order because it's just a building. So basically, we just go with the stories for deciding the location, uh, getting the stone. Also, we can just say that the whole of the tasks are moving along as, as well. Uh, we're doing the stone, and uh, we're happily progressing the all of the user stories pretty nicely goes into the done stage. We get the tasks to go to the done as well, so it's really visible that all of the items are being done. We have this filling up, so it's really kind of Nice, we get the lights, uh, it's moving on, progressing, it's in, uh, some of the stuff. Uh, and then we start with the building of the foundations. Uh, it just starts in the progress uh, and we hit the snag, as always. So basically, when uh, the architects were looking uh, at the sizes of the foundation, it was the tide, and <laughs> they kind of mismeasured. So basically, it seems that we don't have enough stones to get it sorted out. Uh, we hit as an issue. The issue can be solved by the team. The architects decide that we can use the stone. So basically, what happens is uh, we get the new story. Uh, the new story appears to get more stone. Uh, and of course, it gets uh, another task to order the bricks. Uh, and uh, because we have a fixed amount of time, uh, something has to be dropped from the scope. Uh, we decide that it's okay, we'll just go with the bricks. 
and uh, we'll manage in time anyway. So uh, we, we do get some scope left, but the other stuff just keeps moving on, like building this structure halfway. But we just say we'll keep additional stuff for the next iteration. Fantastic. So, so do you want to move the whiteboard slightly out of the way? So we're at the halfway checkpoint. Lighthouse slightly far behind because they had a bit of an issue, but they dropped a bit of scope, which meant they only built it to 15 meters as opposed to 30 meters. That's kind of where we hope to be. The boat is on track. So we'll just go through the next phase of the uh, iteration, the final iteration. So that would be where we, we essentially are looking at January to May. So I'd update the, the, the project information. And we're just progressing with the, the, the same kind of stories again. So we've, we've kind of built a lot of the structure. As you can see, we've built the sides, the various sides, and we've built the, um, some of the, where the crew area is going to be. So the next, the next things we want to want to look at doing is is building the uh, the poop deck. So we've got some tasks there which we're we're getting on with, um, and some crew quarters, and we're quite happily cr progressing with that. And and you expect as everything to go through QA at some point. So this is this is again we're progressing as a project. Someone coming in is is, is looking how they can help, and this looks like a a nice project uh, flow. But again, invariably, we always hit issues. And as we started to finish off a lot of these different elements and things were looking like we were really on track to finish, we hit a snag when building the sails. So the, snails, the sails engineer is sick. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, specialist contractor who is unable to, uh, we're unable to just exchange and change uh, a contractor uh, so quickly. So we really need to think a lot better at how we can actually get around this problem. I don't want to turn this into a blocker yet. I don't want to start asking for help beyond my project, but I, I, I'm sure I can resolve this. So I think the best way of resolving this is to introduce, again, a diff another story, just the same as what Rimmers did, and that's look for a better propulsion mechanism than sails. So is there anyone who can come up with a, you know, a better way of uh, you know, propulsing a boat rather than using the old sails? Oh, motor. Rowing? Mot motor. motor. Yeah. I like that idea. So if we, uh, if we finish off a lot of these tasks and focus on just buying a motor, because we can just go to the shops and buy a motor, we don't really need to think too much uh, about the rest, of the rest of what's involved in building that, we can probably drop the whole idea of anything to do with the sails. Um, we can join all the parts together, but that's a bit of a, the last thing we need to do. And you know what? I think if you use a motor as opposed to using a, uh, a traditional sail, I suspect that you'll actually be able to get across the ocean in less than six weeks. So there's absolutely no need to build fridge units anymore. We've dropped the scope. We've used all of our techniques, all of our agile um, capability to deliver features early, drop scope if necessary, and actually build something which is better than what we set out to uh, in the first place. We didn't know we needed, that's what we needed at the time, but it's actually the, the, you know, kind of focusing on what's important. So we've got a nice boat with a nice outboard motor on it. No fridging units, we've finished everything. In fact, we've finished two weeks early because we just went and bought a boat, uh, bought the, uh, the the motor, and we didn't have to build the sails. And on the other side, it's kind of continuing with the lighthouse. So basically, I'll just move uh, everything. Kind of, we did get the previous iteration stuff done. We did get everything sorted out. All of this stuff works very nice. I'm already kind of finishing the structure, and. Uh, it's uh, almost complete. So basically, at this point, I'm really happy that I'm just going to get my milestones, and uh, it's just going to be walk in the park. So every, everything looks like it's OK. You're going to finish on time. Yeah. You're all set for us to be here in two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we finished early, yeah. and we're a bit faster well, than What we do you mean, like two weeks? Two weeks. Ah, OK. So then the panicking starts. <laughs> 
<laughs> because uh, we were kind of thinking we still have one month and now we have two weeks, okay. We, uh, we, we, we change our time, then we have to drop the scope. Okay, let's, we, we know that we're coming in the noon, so we'll just, let's just drop the whole light stuff. <laughs> so basically you can just decide, ah, we don't need to do this, we'll just, it's gonna be during the day, we, we move it to the drop, we'll just paint the lighthouse to see the rocks, we just move the painting, the finish, the structure is finished. Brilliant. Ah, we hit the target. So as, as no as lights, but that's fine. But it made it. Just want to move that other way. So as we can see, agile can work miracles. That's the end result. We've got a lighthouse there. The power supply isn't quite working. Isn't quite finished yet. Lights not quite working yet. But that's fine because we dropped the scope. We used the consistent ways of working. The projects did exactly what they needed to do using the techniques and. All of, the, uh, all of the methodologies that you've probably learned in all these different uh, seminars today. Uh, and we delivered on time. Just brilliant. The reality is, this is what usually happens. <laughs> so what happened? Okay, so the boat was twice as fast as we expected it to be. That was brilliant. You know, it was a stroke of genius. Uh, who, who'd have known the business wanted it to be twice as fast, but you know they're not going to turn that down. The lighthouse was a little bit delayed, not serious delayed, but it, you know there was, there was a few things that they didn't get done in the first iteration. So the boat wasn't finished; it was released early. Um, we didn't factor in the daylight saving hours, so we've got an hour that we've automatically lost. Um, you know, lots of other reasons. When it was crossing the channel, it was kind of 4 a.m. in the morning, as it was expected at noon because it was coming across that fast. Um, so generally, what are we talking about? Because we're talking you know, analogies here, we're not talking about specific software development. Generally, each project did exactly what it should have done. It op operated exactly within Agile um, frameworks, exactly how it, it should. You could even make analogies to continuous deployment and continuous integration in there. Um, and everything was tested, and everything was, you know, kind of, you know, the scope was, Features were delivered beyond expectations. But fundamentally, they were just doing right by themselves and kind of wrong by the program, wrong by the enterprise. Fundamentally, each project wasn't concerned or visible to one another despite the joint goals. No one was really looking. So how can you get around that? Well, you've probably heard of things called Scrum of Scrums. We call it a program scrum. Um, if you're just operating within your own project, you might wonder what all of those people are doing. Um, you know, kind of talking about everyone's project as if uh, they're on a need-to-know basis. They're not. Uh, we hold a 9.45 a.m. daily huddle, which contains every single project manager. So we've got all 20 of them around the board. We've got all the heads of departments, all the infrastructure, well, all the main infrastructure guys. And quite often we get a lot of the executives there as well. And we are there to try and block issues and react to significant changes Dates being a significant change, blockers, serious delays being a significant change, architecture decisions to not put a light on a lighthouse. Um, and that, that allows us to, uh, to kind of manage all of the, uh, the programs and projects and look after the enterprise as a whole without putting in over, you know, kind of overarching processes or lots and lots of... Uh, you know, kind of sub-processes which allow Agile to work, but only if you follow in this direction. So what's a scrum of scrum boards or a program board look like? This is generally what it looks like. We break it down into the various programs of work, and it's focused towards, similar to scrum boards, is we're trying to progress projects through a life cycle, um, and we've got rag statuses and so forth on there as well. Uh, we have three columns on the end which are important to us. Um, the first one, or the third one in the lanes, is uh, one to two weeks to go. So by having something and paying attention to the things that are about to go live in about one to two weeks, that's generally what we're talking about most mornings. We don't really focus too much on here because projects are looking after themselves. Unless they've got big orange stickers associated with them or red magnets on them. The other two are very, very much deployment into live and then 
done, finished, PIRs complete. So let's have a little bit closer look at what a project card might look like. This is a project with an issue associated with it. It's got a release name, so we try to work on releases rather than projects. It has a rag status, where we use the magnets to actually hold the cards to the board. Uh, it's got the initials of the PM uh, and the, the, the projected release date. And one of the things that we try to encourage, I will get to questions in a second, I promise. One of the things that we try to encourage is all activities on this board happens at the 945 uh, huddle. So that's slightly different to where Scrum's work is. If someone changes a date, we want them to actually walk up and scrub out the date and change it in sight of everyone. So that's why, and one of the reasons I like practical thing, practical ways of working, because we can't find this flexibility on digital cam boards quite as much. Um, and hopefully, I kind of demonstrated some of the aspects of uh, you know kind of following all the rules and still getting it wrong when it comes to agile. Thank you very much. So we have time only for one question. Who wants? Nobody. You? Okay. So you were saying, you were saying that um, you prefer the physical whiteboards instead of digital, right? Yes. But you were also saying that you have teams located in various different locations. So how do teams in different locations work with physical whiteboard, which I assume we have only one instance of it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So we've got two ways of getting around that. The first one is, it was a rather crude um, way of, of counteracting the problem where we have someone take a high resolution picture of every single whiteboard every evening and it gets posted on our SharePoint site. Uh, that works surprisingly well because you can zoom in and actually read the details of the task. The second thing is we do actually entertain the idea of digital Kanban boards. We are looking at introducing TFS 2012 and we do use things like Trello. The difference is we, we exclusively use them for tasks. They are not an alternative to a physical Kanban board. This is still a shop window. A digital Kanban board will quickly become an Excel spreadsheet hidden on someone's computer, which no one looks at, and only the project team is interested in. So that's why I'm a big fan of the physical things, because low-tech, they're as interactive or as cluttered as you want them to be, but I'd never want to see the green stickers, the orange stickers, and the yellow stickers disappear from this kind of Kanban board. Whereas I'd quite happily see the, the pink tasks move into a digital uh, Kanban board approach. Uh, the additional stuff is that you can always kind of, if you have quickly to append something, you can just write on it. Just you'll put the task later on. So it's while it's going. So you could like kaboom. <laughs> so it's really visible. You cannot do that on the digital one. So. So thanks, David and Remontas, for this speech. I hope they will answer to your questions during this short break. Thank you. <laughs>